This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is totally take of it. Today we're going to be talking about a show that I've just discovered recently and I am a living for it. Dying for it, begging for it, begging for it so much so that uh, actually, um, you know, I'm begging for it because they post one episode a week and I can't, I, uh, I can't wait for the next episode to come out. And it's been a while that I've been really, really, really enjoying a show like this. And it's been a while that I've been kind of wishing that a show like this were on a Netflix so that they would release the whole show all at once. But no, it's on some other channel. AMC on uh, the AMC network so they post an episode a week or every other week depending on you know but anyway the show I'm about to talk to you about is Kevin can F himself um geez Louise living for it executive producers Valerie Armstrong Rashida Jones Will McCormack Craig De Gregorio. genre dark comedy Raw. So, um, before we get to talking about Kevin Kneff himself and my kind of running you through it, reviewing it, talking about the episodes I've seen thus far, subscribe to my channel here on YouTube if you haven't already, uh, and uh, follow me on all my you know other channels, the main channel, perfume channel, every channel. <laughs> And to thank you to all the people who have actually become members of my main channel and uh, patrons, you can too, by pushing the join button on the main Super Jacob channel. Uh, thanks to you guys, even the incredible new channels that I'm initiating, as is this pop culture channel, Totally Jacob, is possible. And this video is being filmed live, by the way, in front of virtual audience. So all my co-reviewers and co-chatters are in the sidebar with me. We're going to talk about Kevin can F himself. Now... This is so funny to me that uh, Annie Murphy, who is Alexis in Schitt's Creek, always kind of ends up as a main character in a TV show that has these weird names in it. You know, Shit and F. Annie Murphy. What are you going to do? A little bit Alexis. A little bit Alexis inside of Kevin Can F himself. From Schitt's Creek to Kevin Can F himself. Well... I started watching this show just because of Annie Murphy, because it was suggested to me and I was like, oh my God, Annie Murphy's in this? I didn't know that she was in another show after Shit's Creek. I'm so happy that she got another job. Not to be shady, I think she deserves all the jobs in the world, but you know, right after a huge show like that to immediately jump into a new show, be cast as a main, you know, as a lead in a new show, that's a big deal. That doesn't happen to everybody after they come out of one show. Uh, but, but but again, she did like win all the awards for Shit's Creek for the last season. So it was kind of like, I guess, maybe also to be expected that she would have a prosperous career. And I'm super happy for her. And of course, because of her, I clicked on that show. And so I click on Kevin Can F himself, the first episode. And <clears throat> the first episode starts playing. And it's your typical sitcom. Oh, spoiler alert. Yes, I'm going to walk you through the show. So, if you don't want to know, you haven't watched the show, see you later, alligator. You've been warned. Otherwise, stay with me. Okay, spoilers begin here. The TV show begins as a sitcom. A regular, you, you know, your classical sitcom. You know, like Full House. That type of setting. It's like... You hear the laughter of the audience, like filmed in front of a live uh, studio audience, just like we're filming now in front of a virtual audience, by the way. My, my co-chatters are here with me. And uh, so you hear the laughter in the background. You have this classic sitcom stage setting, you know, like Roseanne Barr, um, like, like the Roseanne show. Uh, living room scenario. There's a couch in the middle of the living room. There's a family dynamic happening. There's a wife with a husband, husband's friend, husband's father, the female friend of the family. They're all in this kind of living room talking and um, puns have been are being thrown at each other. You know, the typical lighting for a sitcom, overlit, poppy colors, no shadows anywhere. Everything is lit. There is no drama. There's no shadow. Sitcoms don't have shadows. Sitcoms are all about everything is lit from every angle. 
So it, it gives a certain vibe, a certain laughter induced such a sitcom. Psychologically, it's lighthearted. So even very hardcore topics are treated lightheartedly also because of the illumination. The setting is made in a way that you spend your 20 minutes during an episode of sitcom laughing, taking serious situations of life and mellowing them down. Of course, there's more to a sitcom than that, but basically that's what they're offering us at the beginning of Kevin Kenneff himself. Annie Murphy, um, and I'm really bad with names. What's her? Allison is her name in the show. Allison is there with um, Eric uh, Peterson, who's Kevin. Then we also have Alex Bonifer, who's Neil O'Connor. Brian Howe is uh, Eric Peterson's dad in the show. So Annie Murphy is Allison is there, and she's kind of like... She's beautiful. You know how she is. She's a beautiful face, body, you know. And then, like, you see Kevin. The show is about him, and the show is called Kevin Kneff himself. So Kevin is, you know, a little bit chubbier, rounder. He's not handsome. Like, she is beautiful. So you ask yourself, why is she with a guy like that? And he kind of bosses her around, but it's all like, ha, 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 you know? He breaks stuff, she picks it up, she cleans after him, he throws stuff everywhere. He's like a, he's like a grown-up kid. They're married, right? They're in their, like, 30s or what have you. Married couple. But it's the sitcom scenario, a little bit like married with children, but she's not like Peggy Bundy. She's serious. She does the cleaning. She's not like Peggy. She's not lazy. And um, there's a little bit of kind of back and forth between her and him in the first scene. And it's just, it's a sitcom. The audience is laughing. Everything is lighthearted. But you feel like I felt sorry for her. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's cleaning up. And like, she's taking, she's the grunt of the joke all the time. And they're kind of saying what they want to say to her. And she's kind of like, just passive doing stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is a weird sitcom. They're, they're not kind to her, but everybody's laughing about it. And just when I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe this is a new way of kind of, it's like married with children on speed for 2021. And in that moment, that scene in the living room where all the characters are in, Annie Murphy slash Allison exits to the kitchen, exits the living room into the kitchen and as she opens the door, there's a cut. There's an edit there. And she's in the kitchen. Alone. Everything changes. It's not a sitcom anymore. Shadows everywhere. Remember I told you in sitcoms, no shadows. This, the camera changed, the lighting changed, the color grading changed. Everything has that gray, green like, 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 as if they were filming with a Fuji camera, that green, grainy film grain. All of a sudden, we're not in a sitcom anymore. We are in a drama. Typical lighting for dramatic shows. She's in the kitchen alone, and there's no more, like, you know, the sitcom, like, ha, 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 pun, ha, 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 silence. There is no more audience watching. There's no more clapping, laughing. No, we are all of a sudden in a drama show when she's alone in that kitchen. And she's like, you know, like taking a breath. And I'm like, wow, what just happened here? What the hell just happened here? This is some Twin Peaks shit going on here. I was like, okay, okay, okay. Now we're getting, now, now my curiosity has been peaked. And uh, she has to kind of prepare some food in the kitchen. Then there's a scene next to the fridge. She sees a cockroach running. She steps on it. It's on her shoe. She cleans it off. But she's not disgusted by it because she doesn't wash her hands after she takes it off with her hands. The cockroach, by the way. Uh, and then she takes the plate, goes back into the living room to give it to, to, to Kevin. And of course, as she re-enters the living room, sitcom again. Happy face. The jokes, the puns continue every time she's around Kevin. Sitcom. Every time she's alone, silence, loneliness, drama. 
And that's how the first episode goes. You start to learn about that, dyna- about that dynamic. Every time she exits the room where he is in, the sitcom ends and the drama begins. And her life, we get to slowly discover Allison's life. Uh, she's not happy in her marriage. She doesn't have any friends. The female friend um, of the guys, which is basically Kevin and um, Neil O'Connor, two best friends that hang out with their with Kevin's dad, who's Pete McRoberts character, uh, hanging out with them is Patty or Mary Hollis in Bowden is the name of the actress. So she's Patty. Patty looks amazing. Patty looks like a very young. Um, why am I so brain dead? What's her name? Rosie O'Donnell. She looks like a very young Rosie O'Donnell to me. It has that vibe about her. So I loved her from the get-go because I love Rosie. But uh, of course, seeing her here on the IMDb profile, she looks very different from her character in the show. In the show, she does look like Rosie O'Donnell, but younger Rosie O'Donnell. But anyway, she has that zhuzh about her. And uh, But we realized pretty soon that Allison is not friends with Patty. Patty, like, I'm, pretty soon we realize, like, Patty doesn't want to be friends with anybody. She just hangs out with the guys. But So you really start thinking, like, Allison is alone. And she walks through the city and she runs errands. Kevin sends her off to buy this, to buy that. She just does everything for him, but she's very frustrated. And slowly, as time develops, we get to see more of the dramatic parts You know, it's very well cut, edited, between the sitcom lighting, the sitcom scenario. It's like, I I gotta tell you guys, the first time I was watching it, the first couple of episodes, I got these anxiety attacks. Not like hyperventilation, but because all my childhood memories, like all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my God, they're messing with my mind. Because growing up, you know, you're just educated as a consumer of, of, of pop culture. You're educated to, you know, you watch a sitcom like a sitcom. You watch a drama like a drama. You don't mix the two. And all of a sudden, the two are mixed. And it caused something in me emotionally. Um, it made me very depressed. <laughs> Not that the show is bad. It just made me... I was like, oh my God, yeah, sitcoms are actually... They depict sadness through laughter but if somebody takes that sitcom environment away from you and it, it, they keep slapping you with, now it's a sitcom, now it's a drama, now it's a sitcom, now it's a drama, you're exhausted by the time an episode is over. You feel, you go through the motions. I felt exhausted the first couple of episodes. Later on, I got used to it. And now I crave it because now I'm, I feel more elevated. I feel like I've broken into the next level of narrative, stylistic I got to repeat it again. Narrative, stylistic narration, storytelling. Um, And uh, it exhausts you because she's so sad when she's alone. And then she comes into the room and, and then she goes out and it's again like this. And then she goes back into the room and, and you just, it exhausts you because you feel for this character, but you feel for this character from very different psychological points of view. So it exhausts you because you keep adapting through the whole show. As a viewer, you're forced to readapt over and over and over again to the scenario. And it's amazing. Socially speaking, what a masterpiece of a show. Now, uh, you know, I haven't seen the end of season one because they only post an episode a week. So I don't know where this is going yet. It might end up in some really boring, shallow place, but it's building up to be something very interesting. Why is it building up to be something very interesting? Even though crazy... Now, the story is as crazy as any sitcom story can be because what Allison wants to do in this show, spoiler alert again, is something that in a drama you would never do it this way. A woman that's unhappy in her marriage, she wants to leave the marriage, she would want to divorce. But no, Allison doesn't want a divorce. Allison decides that she wants to kill Kevin. So Allison starts thinking about ways to kill him without being caught. You see how this is getting interesting now? So she she thinks that the best way to do this without getting caught 
is by um, getting some pills. Which pills was she talking about? And overdosing him on certain pills so that, but those pills would be like antidepressant pills or anti-pain or painkillers. And she heard from some police officer because somebody else was found dead. And the police officer said, oh yeah, she was doing some research on how to kill her husband in the library. As she went to the library to do research about how to kill her husband, the librarian asks her, why are you here? She was eating in the library and the librarian said, you can't eat in the library. What do you want? She's like, oh, I'm doing a research. I'm going to write a book. And the book is about a wife wanting to kill her husband. And the librarian looks at her and says, uh-huh. She's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a book. <laughs> She's like, okay, well, the books that you're looking for with that topic are in that section. So Allison goes into that section and she finds at that table, a person is kind of like just like laying there, very Twin Peaks as well. She comes closer and the guy's dead. He's just died at the table doing research on the internet, looking at watching porn, <laughs> died in a library. The cops come, they pick him up. She's like shocked at what she saw. And she said, oh my God, how did he die? And they said, it's probably an overdose of some pill of some antidepressant or anti-painkillers or you know people get hooked on that in the states a lot and she's like well you know she's like is anybody going to investigate this he's like no it just happens all the time there's nothing to investigate like something like that so she gets the idea okay well if nobody investigates if this is something typical for this part of town or for this type of town where everybody's depressed everybody's poor everybody's borderline too poor this is a good way to kill my husband I'm going to give him these pills and he's going to die. But how do I get these pills? So she goes to the doctor and says she has a backache. She's really in pain. She would really like some pills. The doctor says, you know, these are very addictive, the pills that you're asking for. I don't think it's a good idea for you. But then the, the nurse that was helping the doctor says, basically, it took an episode for Allison to figure out. The nurse was telling her, I can hook you up. Here's, a, here's a, an address. Could you imagine the nurse? Every, everybody's corrupt there classic so anyway long story short you know she's not really friends with the chick with the uh, rosie o'donnell looking chick that's friends with her husband kind of or, or we think she's friends with her husband um but that chick works in a hair salon now it turns out that the address that allison was given to get the pills was at that hair salon and turns out that the person who's giving those, who's selling pills illegally, is her. It's it's her next door neighbor or slash uh, Patty, Mary Hollis in Bowden, uh, or in Bowden. Uh Are you in Bowden? <laughs> it's in Bowden, whatever. Anyway, little joke. Oh my God, so not funny. But so anyway, so uh, she um, says, oh, it's you. And the other one is like, you want a haircut? She's like, no, I came here for the pills. And she's like, fuck. Uh, beep. You know, I'm like, okay, we can't do this. Anyway, so she says, well, I know what you do now. So I want the pills. I got the money. I'm good for it. And then she says, well, I don't have the pills now. I have to get them on Monday. And then they start talking and conversing. Then a lot of stuff happens. The pills don't happen because Patty has a connection with the pharmacist. Because of something Allison did, the pharmacist gets caught so she doesn't get the pills anymore. And all of a sudden, you know, but Patty wants to know, like, why do you want the pills? You don't seem like the type who needs the pills. Allison then lies about why she needs the pills. She says, you know, this guy, I did something really bad. I was high on coke the other night, which I never did before in my life, but I did that time. And this guy, yeah, and I did something really stupid. I blacked out. I stole these guys' pills. Now he wants them back. And he's like, after me, he's stalking me. I really got to get get those pills back to him so please help me out i need those pills and then she said okay okay i have no contact with the pills anymore because the pharmacist got caught i don't have i can't i don't have access to pills but i have a contact somewhere outside of town we would have to drive somewhere so drive with me outside of town let's try to get these pills so of course they go on this tell mind louise type of adventure and uh they try to get the pills, but they get the cocaine instead of the pills and they got to exchange the coke for the pill. It's like all a big adventure of how to get these freaking pills since two episodes we're trying to get these pills so that Allison can start killing her husband. <laughs> but nobody, know, nobody knows that she wants to do it. So basically the last episode I've seen, Allison comes clean to Patty. They do become friends, kind of, because Allison says... 
Patty doesn't like anybody. Patty doesn't like Allison. Allison keeps trying to make friends with Patty. Patty's like, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like you. And then as they're driving in this car, very Tom and Louise moment on the road, they have this bonding moment where Allison says, hey, can we talk? Patty's like, I don't want to talk. And then, she's, and then she's like, you know, a little pun here, pun there. And they kind of open up and Patty says she had a terrible childhood. She hated her mother. Her mother was terrible. And then Allison says, like, what happened to her? And Patty says she died. And I guess Patty said something like, I wish I killed her. And then Allison looks at Patty and says, don't worry, I killed her for you. And then Patty starts talking more. And Allison says, why do you talk more now? Do you like me now all of a sudden? She's like, yeah, now you're okay. She's like, why did you change your mind all of a sudden? And then Patty says, well, because you told me you killed my mother. I like that. And kind of, wow, what a way to bond. The most macabre way to bond. And they bonded. But in all of this process, what somebody might fail to realize is that every time we see Kevin, we're in the sitcom. And then we can go, we shift to Allison and then we're outside of the sitcom. But all of a sudden, also when we see Patty alone, when the camera doesn't follow Allison, but just follows Patty, Patty is also living in the drama world. Patty is also not in the sitcom. Patty is also super depressed and sad, unhappy in her relationship. She really doesn't like her husband, or so it seems. She's just super unhappy. In her, she's really, really depressed and sad in her relationship. And it's really sad and painful to see. But uh, so uh, Allison is still lying to Patty about why she needs the pills. But at the end of the episode, of this last episode I've seen, Patty's like, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, a gun was involved. A lot, a lot happened in that episode to get to these spills. A little bit too much even. But the twist is that at the end of that episode, Allison comes clean to Patty and tells her, I lied to you. I don't need the pills for some John Doe who was running after me because I was, you know, I blacked out on Coke and I stole his pills. That's all not true, Patty. The truth is I want to kill Kevin. So she shared that deepest inner frustration with this woman who she just started bonding with. And the first thing you think is, oh my God, don't say that to somebody. If you tell that to somebody, you're done for. This is like exposing yourself. Don't do, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, but she says it. Uh, and of course, that's the end of the episode. And now I'm tantalating for the next episode because I'm like, oh my God. And uh, a lot happened in that episode, which I'm not going to touch base on because, you know, she took Kevin's car, Kevin tried calling her. Patty said, don't answer always the phone. Don't always be available for him. And because she wasn't available for him, Kevin called the cops because he thought the car was stolen. And then the cops stopped them. Then Patty, who's always acting this cool chick, like she can handle drug dealers. She can handle everything. She freaked out as the cops stopped them. And that's when Allison steps in and shows true courage and manages to kind of fake the whole, you know, hey, hey, officer, what's the problem? You know, a little bit coquette, a little bit flirtatious, saying that her dad was a police officer as well. So Patty is impressed that Allison managed to really easily get rid of the police officers. And so she has even more respect for her now. And anyway, uh, Allison says to Patty, you see, this is why I wanted to answer the phone when it was ringing, because if Kevin doesn't get what he wants, this is how he reacts. He only thinks about himself. He keeps ruining my life. When I got a job many years ago, he didn't want me to have a job. He didn't want me to have a career. He didn't want me to have my own life. So he did everything to ruin my job and I lost my job and I have to be confined to the home. I started saving up money. We had a, a joint savings account. He spent all that money from the savings account. Never told me that he spent all the money. We're broke now. He kept lying to me. He's just acting like a kid and I'm done with it. I lied to you. I don't need these pills to give them back to this John Doe because he's allegedly stalking me. No, I need these pills because I want to use them to kill Kevin. And of course, Patty is like this, end of episode. Now my mind is thinking, well, Patty is also depressed just like him. Maybe, so what's the outcome now? I'm thinking either Patty is going to tell her, hey, you know what, let me kill my husband and you kill yours too. But then I think that would be too suspicious because they're neighboring houses. They live in houses joined to each other. So like two husbands die at the same time. That's kind of suspicious, isn't it? 
Patty could go to the cops or could go to Kevin and tell him, hey, your wife wants to kill you. But then that would not make for a good TV show because that would end the plot. And we still have a couple of episodes to go till the end of the season. So what's the other option? And the other option would be Patty says, you're crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And then they don't see each other for a couple of episodes while Allison still keeps working on how to kill her husband. And then after a couple of episodes, maybe Patty decides to help her after all, because maybe Allison does kill him after all. And then Patty kind of decides to help her get away with it. Or Patty goes like, Patty could go just in the next episode and be like, all right, I'll help you. He's a dick. I see it. But even the plot line being as crazy as it is, because as I said before, I, I'm sure they're in like this poor neighborhood, not a lot of money. She doesn't have a prospect for the future. What to do? Divorce him. No. But then I thought to myself, there's one more character here. Uh, and that would be kind of Allison's ex-fling from high school. He came back to this little city and opened up a cafe. And his name is Sam, acted by Raymond Lee. Raymond Lee as Sam is the ex-love interest of Allison from high school. So he's back in town. He's been in a Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time. He's been an addict, whatever. And now he's back in town, got his shit together, got his life together, has a wife, apparently. And uh, by accident, Allison sees, I mean, it's such a little town. How can she not know that a new bar opened up? Whatever. That's also like, you know, some plot holes in there that don't really match up. But she finds out by accident that he has this gorgeous cafe, also very shit's Creek. Uh, and uh, she meets him there again. She's like, oh, you're back in town. He's like, yeah, I opened this cafe. And then you see that there's still chemistry between them. They start flirting. So, you know, this goes on for a couple of episodes. When them two are together, there's no sitcom. When them two are together, we're still in the dramatic setting with the dramatic lighting, right? So he finally, they had a little falling out because, you know, there's this tension between them two. But then he invites her to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting because it's his I don't know which year or which month. I guess he's been a couple of years sober now. So he invites her to it. And she she makes a huge effort to make it because Kevin doesn't want to let her go. But she manages to go anyway. Uh, even though Kevin spills sauce all over her. So we feel sorry for her all the time. She has this pretty dress. She put on this pretty dress to go uh, what's his name? to Sam's Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. But then Kevin spilled sauce all over her, so she put a jacket on and kind of covers herself like this all the time while she's talking to Sam. She's embarrassed that she has the sauce. Like, you feel so sad for her. You want her to be happy. You really do. And Annie Murphy does a really a great job at portraying the innocent pain uh, that Allison is feeling. And um, so Sam is at this meeting. Allison makes it on time, even though she's all dirty. But Sam's wife doesn't make it on time. Sam's wife has more important things to do. Sam's wife comes towards the end of the meeting. And then Allison kind of steps back because, you know, Sam's like, oh, this is my, you know, wife. Remember her and blah, blah, blah. But obviously, you know, Allison is touching Sam's leg with her leg while they're at the beginning of the meeting. Like, she feels stuff for him. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is all happening in parallel as she's planning to kill Kevin. I'm like, but... Sam can leave his wife, they can divorce, could be messy. You leave your guy, you're not alone. You got some other guy who still obviously desires you, who still obviously has the hots for you, who still obviously maybe doesn't love you yet still or anymore or possibly could love you again. But like you have a prospect for the future. You're not that desperate that you need to kill a guy and end up in jail. So I'm still not quite understanding why she's so obsessed with killing him rather than finding another solution to this relationship issue that she's having. It's a little bit ridiculous. But then again, it's a sitcom scenario for the most part. Everything concerning Kevin's life when the cameras are rolling on him, it's a sitcom. But then again, you never talk about, oh, I want to kill you in a sitcom. So it's very bizarre. And I'm thinking, why, she seem, why is she so dumb? Why does she think the only solution to this is to kill him? So I'm really curious now that she confessed uh, to uh, Patty that she wants to get rid of him. How will Patty react? Is Patty also going to be like, oh, yeah, cool. Let's do it together. Or is she going to try to kind of tell her like, hey, snap out of it, girl. There's other ways of getting rid of Kevin. But storyline and plot holes aside, I feel like it's such a wonderful structure and every time they, they show the dramatic part of the show it, with the cameras and the lighting, 
the show is shot around Halloween. It's supposed to be shot around Halloween. So you have this, it looks just like Haddonfield, Illinois, very much John Carpenter's Halloween. So the set, you got the leaves on the streets, you got those, you know, rural houses in America, that kind of neighborhood. It looks like a slasher movie waiting to happen. It looks like, you know, Michael Myers is going to appear out around every corner. So there's that beauty of falling leaves, of, of the sadness of, of fall. But, I, you know, autumn and fall is my favorite time of the year. So there's all of that, which to me, it's so soothing to my, especially now in summer, that the show is playing in summer, watching fall. To me, the whole year is just a countdown to Halloween, basically. <laughs> so, you know, anyway. But um, uh, Halloween addict here, Jacob, Halloween addict. Hi, Jacob. Hi. Uh, and um, so, and the you know, everything has that aesthetic of slight decay and it's just so beautiful to watch there's this beautiful aesthetic as opposed to the oversaturated lights of the sitcom element so just aesthetically alone it's super appealing uh dramaturgically speaking the way that they're building it all up between the sitcom and the drama it just flows it flows in some episodes better than in others but nevertheless that's how it's built up and i'm really curious to see if at all in this show, are we ever going to see Kevin alone? Because we never really see Kevin on his own. Kevin is always surrounded by friends, buddies, his dad. And it's always a sitcom, yay, yay type of scenario. You know, we're the boys, you know, boys will be boys. Ha ha ha, goofing around. But I wonder if we're ever going to get a camera on him alone. Like seeing Kevin exit the sitcom living room and enter the kitchen alone. Are we ever going to see his dramatic reality i wonder at the same time i think maybe kevin is maybe kevin doesn't have that side to him he doesn't have that depth maybe he is just that shallow uh, maybe maybe that's exactly what the camera is showing us kevin only has that reality like when we are in kevin's world we only have the silly shenanigan sitcom scenario because that's his world and everybody else has the dramatic real world uh, but what is uh, I, so i would like to see kevin in the dramatic world but also but also what i'm also missing in this show is why not add another world you know why do we have to limit it it's very limiting it's amazing the first couple of episodes but now i want more now now i want it to grow and i'm thinking to myself why limit it just to sitcom and drama why not add another layer an, another aesthetic altogether you know that would make it even more deep and more interesting um add another universe another aesthetical genre and universe to it would be genius and brilliant i just wonder if they went that far and because i have all these questions about the aesthetics and about the narration of it i'm just looking i'm so looking forward to future episodes because i see so much potential in this show and i'm very well aware of the fact that i'm probably going to going to end up being quite disappointed with it because i don't think that they're going to push it that far but um i'm ready to be very pleasantly surprised and i'm very ready for them to push it that far and even further but it's definitely a show worth watching. The narration and aesthetics alone, the stylistics alone are worth it. It's been a while since there's been a show like that out there. So that's my uh, review thus far of uh, Kevin Can F himself. What y'all guys think? Uh, <laughs> Fast Lexa says, LOL, sounds like where I grew up in Michigan. That's how the scenario sounds like. Andrew Becerra says, we need Jacob to do a TV show. I would love to. I would love to write for a TV show and direct a TV show. Are you kidding me? I would, I would live in for it. Dying for it. Debbie says, if Kevin dies, is the show over? Debbie, that's a really good point. I wonder like if if she does get away with it, it really goes through with it and, and actually does uh, kill him. How would it, how can it continue? We don't know how it could continue. I mean, I wish it would continue even after his death. And then, as I said, to experiment even more layers of reality, we could go into science fiction. We could go into vintage. I mean, it could be a lot of different things. At first I thought, when the show started, I was like, wow, this looks like, you know, what they did with, uh, with the Marvel's universe of uh, WandaVision. You know, it had that vibe, but no, it's different. It's, it, it, 
it's more subtle than WandaVision. And WandaVision ended up with, for me, being a disappointment. It's like, oh, okay, she created that in reality first, blah, blah, blah. This is different. This is not one character creating reality for others. This is everybody living in their own. And some share realities. Raquel Bain says, your description of this show piques my interest. Raquel, I'm telling you, give it a go. It's really interesting. And Annie, and all, I mean, it's wonderfully cast. All of the actors are brilliant. You really see the love and the effort that they put in, in, in the show, in acting. And, and Annie's just a sweetheart. You just want to hug her all the time. She can really deliver. Uh, Jack says, that total switch of lighting color is used a lot in live plays too as a signal of the mood changing. Yes, Jack, I know. And in theater, they use this, but it's different in film or in television because you're not in the same space. In theater, you still are. It's that same stage. This is a different universe altogether. Even the narration changes. The tone, the breathing, everything, the lighting, the sound, the camera angles. In a theater, we always have the same angle. We're, as audience, are sitting always here. Just like they film a sitcom. Angle this, angle that, angle that. But no, when, when Allison enters the kitchen the first time, all of a sudden you got a close up to the face, filming from the top down. You know, this vertiginous, this kind of oppressing, you know, she's filmed squished down. That's something you don't get in theater. That's, that's the magic of a camera that you can't get uh, in live theater. It sounds fascinating. It does, guys. It does. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think about Kevin Kneff himself. And uh, maybe I can make more videos on the upcoming episodes. Like, you know, we need to follow up on this and see where this journey <laughs> takes us. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, don't forget, this was totally Jacob. See you all soon. Never give up on love. Bye.